I see we have a lot of folks that are starting uh, to join in. So thank you all. We'll start in just a few minutes. All right, I think we will go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to say um, welcome to the League of Women Voters of the La Crosse areas, November No Lunch and Learn. Uh, and today we're focused on the national popular vote featuring Bob, uh, Barb Patrick. Um, I'm Robin Schmidt. I'm the vice president of the League of Wisconsin Voters of La Crosse area. And I'm substituting for Mary Nugent, who is with us in the audience, but um, is still recovering for, from knee surgery. And so we kind of took, um, let her uh, be able to enjoy this and not have to work for this, um, for this lunch and learn. So um, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, uh, Nora Garland is going to be monitoring our uh, question and answers. Um, I want to remind folks, if you have questions um, after any of the speakers, to please type in your question on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And then after Ellen France is done and after uh, Barb is done, we'll have an opportunity to ask those questions and have the speakers address them. And um, thank you, Nora, for doing that. Um, I wanted to just uh, uh, say a couple of things um, uh, before we get started with the speakers, first, I want to say, um, wow, what an election um, and what an effort to get out the vote and to thank everybody who's watching. I know that everybody played a role in whether it just be voting yourself or helping neighbors get to the polls or working as a poll worker or um, just uh, making people aware of the upcoming election. Anything you did to help get the vote out, uh, we're really appreciative. Um, as a nonpartisan organization, the League is committed to ensuring safe and accessible elections, and it can't be achieved without having strong support of all of you. So thank you um, for getting the word out and getting the vote out. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, we are hoping to turn the switch on our new website and organizational management system hopefully maybe later this week. Uh, we're very excited. We've got some great features that we're hoping that you will enjoy. Um, and uh, for members, when this happens, you'll be getting an email that will ask you to log in and establish um, a, a password. So that would be your cue that, that we've transitioned to our new website. The website address doesn't change at all. Um, so you can still um, get to our website as you normally would. And um, we encourage you to do that. We have some new features. Um, for example, we have a nice calendar. We have our program information up there. We have a photo library um, and obviously a lot of information on elections. So um, uh, we encourage you to keep checking out our, uh, our website. And when you get that email, log in and create a password. I um, also wanted to just mention quickly some events that we have coming up. Um, uh, you can see here, uh, these were also in the newsletter that was um, sent out recently. And again, big kudos to Nora Garland, who does a fabulous job on our newsletter. Um, and so there's a lot of activities going on in the next couple of weeks. And so we encourage you to stay engaged. And as long as we're kind of going into winter hibernation mode, um, it's a good opportunity to make some time for these kind of events. Um, we're doing something new. Um, we're having a happy hour on November 18th. I just wanted to point that out. It's a half hour. Um, and we're going to be viewing uh, a per the perfect um, 36 and beyond. It's a musical that's got some narration by local league members and it's very cute and it's very fun and we think that um, you will enjoy it. So please um, go to our website. You'll be able to see how to get logged in for that and, um, and encourage you to, to have some fun with us. So um, uh, the next person I'm going to um, turn on spotlight here is Ellen, who's going to give us an update on what she knows about um, kind of current status of elections, and then she will introduce Barb for our keynote speaker. So hold on, there we go. Ellen, you should be on now. Thank you, Robin. Um, I don't know that I really know much more than many of 
those of you who are viewing, uh, because you stay pretty active and pretty knowledgeable, I have no doubt. Uh, but I did uh, pull up um, a listing from uh, the 2020 calendar of election events uh, that the WEC had online, just to remind people that a couple things happen post-election regardless of any controversy. Um, one is that they schedule audits. Um, the system, they don't audit every machine, but they have a system by which they run audits to make sure that the equipment um, was operating correctly. And uh, that has started already. And the last date for completion of 2020 voting equipment audit and selected municipalities audit reports um, is November 25th. So that's an ongoing process of those municipalities selected. The other thing that always happens is a canvas. And that is just, there's a board of canvassers who tracks through, again, um, the election results. Um, the deadline to convene was yesterday. Um, the deadline for the county board of canvassers to convene is today. The 17th of November is the last day for county clerks to deliver statement of county canvas of general election for state and federal offices to the Wisconsin Elections Commission. So that's a process that always occurs. On December 1st, that is the last day for the chairperson of the Wisconsin Elections Commission to certify the results. Um, so that's the last, the last step in the process um, before any recount can happen. The electors convene on December 14th uh, in Madison, or maybe they're gonna be doing it virtually, I don't know, to cast votes for the president and vice president in Wisconsin. So just a little bit about past recounts, if you don't remember. <laughs> some of us remember some of this. So we had a presidential recount four years ago. It took a little over a week to complete. It cost $3.5 million. Um, Jill Stein campaign, her campaign had to pay for that. And when it was all said and done, Trump gained 131 votes. In 2011, we had a Wisconsin, or maybe it's 16, Wisconsin Supreme Court recount, it was 16. And there was only a 300 vote swing. So historically, when we've done recounts in Wisconsin, there may be some mistakes that are picked up, but they tend to be even handed. They tend to be at best a couple hundred dollars, a couple hundred vote swings, and nothing um, is likely going to occur where we have a 20,000 vote swing to change the results in Wisconsin. Now, the Trump campaign has to pay um, for the recount unless the margin of victory is 0.25% or less. And it's more than that. So if they indeed decide um, to actually follow through on that request for a recount after certification, um, it's going to be on their dime, so to speak. So that's just a little bit about recounts in Wisconsin. The other thing, of course, that's in the news is the transition um, issue. Um, the General Services Administration has to do what is called ascertainment. They have to ascertain that this particular person, in this case, uh, Vice President Biden, um, is the is the winner or likely to be the winner of the election. And when that ascertainment happens, then the transition team of the new president elect can start um, doing background checks, running the checks through the agency, um, the agencies that typically do them in the federal government and get some funding 
to move the transition forward. So that is going to be delayed until uh, the GSA, I think her name is Emily Murphy, I don't remember exactly, um, until that individual um, is able to ascertain that Vice President Biden is indeed the president-elect and this should move forward. It uh, seems to be the unfortunate thing that we're in a place where um, there has been, if not actual factual issues, enough confusion, enough bad information to suggest that perhaps uh, President Trump is gonna find a way around this and change election results. And so nobody wants to go, or, or frankly, very few people want to go against his position and do anything other than sit back and wait to see what happens. Um, one of my one of the things that I found when I was reading a little bit is that apparently there was a 37 day delay Bush v. Gore year, and that does put behind all of the planning um, for the new um, president his team and everything going forward. One commentator at that point said that uh, there was a, some belief that because of that, we were behind the ball when the towers went down that September. So whether that's true or not, I don't know, but obviously a delay um, just sets everything back in terms of moving forward on January 20th. So, um, I hope that this gets resolved quickly and we can move forward. And that's really all, all of the news today. So I don't I know have, if there are any questions. I have a question for you, Ellen. Um, what are the rules or laws for Wisconsin delegates to the Electoral College? Do you know those? Um, no, I don't. I, my, I would guess that they have to if Wisconsin has um, um, had enough, uh, basically the electoral votes go for a particular candidate based on the vote here, it's for President-elect Biden, um, that I, I don't believe they're allowed to change what they wanna do just because they think something else should happen. But again, that's, that's my suspicion. I know that in the past there have been some states where their electors have at least said we may do something different because we don't like the result. Um, and there may be a, state, a few states where they can actually do something other than the will of the, the voters, so to speak. Um, but I, I didn't look at that issue. That's down the road. <laughs> That's the only question I had, Ellen, thanks. Okay. So hearing none, I will introduce our speaker today. Um, Barb will come up any minute, I'm sure. Um, Barb Patrick is a member of the League of Women Voters of Great, Greater Green Bay. She's on the State League's Legislative Committee and is the National Popular Vote Liaison to US League and National Grassroots national popular vote organizations. We are grateful to have Barb available to talk with us today about the national popular vote effort. Welcome, Barb. Thank you. Okay, let's see if I can take over here. I'm gonna do a couple things. I'm gonna to try to share my screen and see if this is gonna work here. <laughs> Think that in the USA, the so-called land of the free, you think that come election day we would have democracy. But the way we choose our president is really quite bizarre. And whether your vote will count at all depends on where you are. And the time has come for us to raise our voice. We don't want the Electoral College to override the people's choice because everybody's vote should count. 
Everybody's vote should count. It seems so simple, it ought to be a given. It shouldn't really matter what state you live in. Everybody's vote should count. And they should count the same amount. Red, blue, green state, every in between state. Everybody's vote should count. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much, Ellen and and Robin and everybody else, Nora, who's working on this. Um, let me go to my full screen here. So I'm here today to talk to you about the National Popular Vote Bill. So what is the National Popular Vote? Well, the National Popular Vote Bill would guarantee the presidency to the candidate who receives the most popular votes nationally. I'm going to repeat that. You'll hear this several times. The National Popular Vote Bill would guarantee the presidency to the candidate who receives the most popular votes nationally. Well, how are the US president and vice president elected? Not by the national popular vote, but by the electoral college. Now, coming off this election last week, um, we all have a little bit more information of electoral college. Some of you may understand it more, and some of you just might be more confused. So huh, what's it about? Well, Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution states that each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. So it's up to each state in each, um, each legislature of each state to determine how they are going to appoint their electors. Now, there are um, electors, uh, the number of electors are, is determined by the Constitution in the, in the following language of that clause. Um, it requires that states have electors representing each of their US senators, so two US senators for all 50 states, plus an elector for each of the congressional representatives. And there are 435 congressional um, representatives. And then, uh, yes. Herb, this is Robin. Um, I'm not sure about anybody else, but I'm still seeing the end of that music video. I'm not seeing any slides. Oh, oh that is weird because I see my slides. So, Ellen, might... are you seeing slides? No, I'm not. Oh, I'm glad you stopped me. I'm so sorry because you guys just missed a bunch. Okay. Um, okay, let me see if I can go back here. Oh, I'm so sorry. Here we go, all this practicing and it didn't work. I have my slides up. I just have to get you guys onto it somehow. Okay. Sometimes if you stop. I'm going to stop it and I'm going yeah. to go back yeah. and share again. So sorry. That no problem. Horrible. Okay. There we go. Thank okay. you. I'm going to go back, you guys, if that's okay with you, because yep. it didn't help if you're listening to me talking about all this if um, <laughs> if you didn't get it. So I'm not recording here, by the way. So I'm not going to, I'm afraid I'm going to mess it up if I do that. So maybe, okay. You can, Robin. Okay. We're sorry, good. sorry. So, okay, you heard me. Okay, I'll start again. The National Popular Vote Bill will guarantee the presidency to the candidate who receives the most popular votes nationally. How are the US president and vice president elected? Not by the national popular vote, but by the electoral college. And as I mentioned, with having just come off a US presidential election, we are acquainted more so with the electoral college, but many of us probably still don't understand it because it's confusing. So what is the Electoral College? How does that work? Article two of the constitution states that each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. So there are by the constitution, two electors representing each of the US senators in each state 
and one elector for each of the US congressional representatives. There are 435 of those. And then you, uh, Washington DC, it doesn't have any representation in Congress, neither senators nor uh, representatives. So they are allotted three electors to vote for president. So there is a total of 535 electors. What does that mean for Wisconsin? Well, of course we have two US senators. We have eight congressional representatives. Um, and so we have a total of 10 electors. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but we don't see Barb now. We just got a notice about that in the chat box. I don't know if that's an easy fix or not, Barb. We hear you just fine, but I thought I'd let folks know. Yeah, the video went off automatically. I'm so sorry. We'll get this yet today. If I can, um, just a second. I need to get my cursor back here. Oh. Okay, we'll try this again. There you go, thanks. So for Wisconsin, as I just say, we have the 10 electors. So who wins then? Well, there are 270 electoral votes needed. <laughs> I think we all know this over and over and over again since our close election that's still going on. Um, but we need 270 electors to win the presidential election. That is the majority of the 538 electors total. So we know Wisconsin has 10 electors and we know each state has an allotted number which we just went over. How do those electors vote? Well, most states, 48 out of 50 states um, and the Washington, in Washington, D.C., have what's called winner-take-all laws. That means that they have their electors cast all of their state electoral votes for the candidate who wins the popular vote in the state, not in the nation, in the state. This is something that is not in the Constitution. Again, it's up to each state to determine that. Remember Article 2 that we talked about a few seconds ago. And it wasn't until mid 1800s when most of the states came around to uh, awarding the winner take all rule, the 100% of their electoral votes to whoever wins in their state. Currently, there are two states, Nebraska, and Maine that do not use the winner take all rule. Both of them use a proportional rule district rule where there are some district electoral votes that go to um, the winner in their districts. And Maine's a little different. I think they have uh, a statewide cup vote or two. And then uh, I think they have two electoral, uh, I mean, sorry, two congressional districts. Um, and then those congressional districts um, have a proportional vote there. So what's the problem with the winner take all electoral rule? Well, the candidate with the most popular votes in the country may not win. That's happened five times out of our 45 presidents. Of course, the most recent is Donald Trump in 2016 who lost the popular vote, but won the electoral college. That happened with George W. Bush in 2000 because Gore won the popular vote but Bush won the electoral vote. It happened with John Quincy Adams, um, I think it's Ruth, Rutherford Hayes and Benjamin Harrison. It almost happened in 2004 with John Kerry. And I think many people don't realize this, but if the state of Ohio had gone for Kerry, if just 62,000 more votes had gone for Kerry, which is a relatively minor number in a big state, all of their electoral votes would have gone to him instead of George Bush. And that would have given the election to Kerry. Although Bush won, this, won the country, won the popular vote by almost 3 million votes. Another problem with the winner take all rule is that the battleground states determine who becomes president. Well, why does this matter? First of all, I wanna go over a little bit, of course, what the battleground states are. Um, and we may realize this again from the election. There, I'm gonna jump ahead to a slide. There are 
reliably red states. You can see them, most of them here, and reliably blue states here, although right now here and here, um, that always go for either the Democratic or the Republican candidate, and there's no contest in those states. Now, this is uh, a picture of the um, battleground states um, as of November 5th. So already here, Wisconsin had been called for Biden and also Michigan. But look at these other states here, which we know um, in many of them, in four of them, I believe, North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada, the votes are still being taken and those have not been called at all. Pennsylvania was the key one last Saturday with their 20 electoral votes that was, um, has been called um, for Biden. Um, and we'll see as voting goes on. So why does it matter that we have our elections focus so much on these battleground states where the potential vote is thought to be very narrow? And of course, this year it was very narrow. Well, first of all, we, there are fights over a small number of votes in the battleground states. That wouldn't occur if we went with the national vote. We're fighting right now, again, over a small numbers of votes in Georgia, and Arizona and Nevada, I think Arizona and Georgia and maybe um, uh, Ellen had these exact numbers to this day, they keep changing, but I think it's around 12,000 votes in those states. Uh, of course, Wisconsin, we're talking about 20,000 votes and we're all fighting over all those individual battleground states for those little bit votes. And I say little bit compared to the 4 million more votes that Biden has won right now. Um, if there was a national popular vote, that would be insignificant. We wouldn't be fighting and having these extended battles. We wouldn't be delaying the transition, for instance. Another battleground problem is that the candidates only pay attention to the purple states. The purple states are the battleground states. <clears throat> this year, this is 2020, two thirds of the country, 33 states, had no candidate attention in 2020. And I guess my, at least on my screen, my picture is covering the no, but two thirds of the country had no candidate attention. There were no campaign events in two thirds of the country. Even more so, 96% of the uh, events, that's 202 events out of 224, were held in only 12 states. That means the candidates are coming to the states and listening to what their voters the, in these other non-battleground states here, what their interests are. They're only going to the battleground states. And look at this, here in Wisconsin, we had 18 events. We had rallies by President Trump and we had virtual events by Vice President Biden. Um, but 18 events here, and of course, Pennsylvania, which with its rich 20 electoral votes had 47 events between the two candidates. Well, how do we fix this? Well, that's the national popular vote state legislation. And why do we wanna go that route versus a constitutional amendment to get rid of the electoral college? Well, we all know getting rid of the electoral college through a constitutional amendment would be number one, a uh, long time coming and probably insurmountable with the way um, the procedure works where you'd have to even have two thirds, I think two thirds of the states uh, agree. Um, so, under the national popular vote legislation, um, we look to the states because the national popular vote is an agreement. It's an agreement between states, a compact, that they will all um, allot their electoral votes similarly. And the state legislatures, as we saw under Article 2, have that authority. So the national popular vote laws award all of the state's electoral votes to the candidate who wins the popular vote in the entire nation, not to the candidate who wins only in the state popular vote. I'm gonna pause here for a second because I think this is the most confusing part of how the electoral college works. Right now, again, all of Wisconsin's 10 electoral votes have been awarded to the winner of the election in Wisconsin, okay? not necessarily who won in the national popular vote. This year, it appears that Vice President Biden, former Vice President Biden 
has won both the national popular vote and the state popular vote in Wisconsin. But let's think about um, what's going on in Georgia. Okay, in Georgia, right now, Vice President Biden is ahead, but only around 12,000 votes. That's very, very close. Okay, so under the current law, Georgia's entire set of electoral votes will go to whoever wins in their state, whether it be Biden or Trump, even though Biden has, is winning the national popular vote by 4 million. So again, the national popular vote laws when enacted will award all the state's electoral votes to the candidate who wins the popular vote in the entire nation. Well, when does it become activated? Well, it becomes activated when enough states join the compact so that their electoral votes cumulatively total 270. And again, remember 270 is the majority of the electoral votes. So why should we even do this again? Well, it guarantees that the candidate with the most popular votes nationwide wins. It ensures that every American's vote is of equal value. Let me go into that one for a second because that might make you kind of scratch your head and think, well, aren't they all of equal value now? Well, let's look at, let's take the state of California where that is now. They, that's it, that is reliably voting Democratic generally. But there are a lot of Republicans in California. So what happens to their votes now? Well, they go to the polls and they vote and the Republicans do and the, and the um, Democrats go and then the Democrats win in the state and the electoral votes of the Republicans no longer count. They're ignored. So the people who vote for the losing candidate in their state or the, we call it the second place winner in their state, their votes don't count anymore. They're just ignored once the state winner is determined. Oops, sorry. Um, the national popular vote makes all states competitive, not just the battleground states. The candidates will have to pay attention to all states, big, small, rural, urban. So the vote, the wishes and concerns of all the population will have to be taken care of. And it honors the will of the people. We always have a question of mandate when a electoral college winner is not the popular vote winner. It encourages candidates to move to the middle and take a more moderate agenda. And this is a biggie because it does not require a constitutional amendment. So what's the current status of the national- Barb, yes. can I ask you a question before we move on? Sure. If you don't mind. So um, given the popular vote issue, what stops candidates from just going to the populist states and not actually going to many of the so-called flyover rural states because they're going to garner more votes if they go to California, New York, Florida, wherever the high population ones are. Um, so what happens is because every single vote counts under the national popular vote, every single vote counts. And do you, right now, if you even take the top, well, here, I think I even hit, can we come back to this? I have a slide to help, I think, um, show this. Will you repeat that at the end? And we'll come back and I'll show you the fact that how many states, the big states, let's say, with a lot of population, it takes to even get to 270 votes, okay? Who, actually, who asked me that question? <laughs> I did, Ellen. Ellen, okay, Ellen, thanks. Yeah, will you ask me yeah, again? I can wait. And then I will go to that and we can talk about that a little bit, okay? I just didn't want to get out of my slide presentation to have to get back in. So um, the current status of the National Popular Vote Compact is that it is passed in 15 states plus Washington, D.C. Those states have 196 of the 270 electoral votes needed. Only 74 more electoral votes are needed to make the National Popular Vote Compact become effective. Um, Colorado came up in an earlier question before we started the presentation. So that's a very interesting uh, state um, with regard to the National Popular Vote. In June of 2019, 
Colorado did pass the national popular vote and their governor signed it and it became law. But then a group who opposed it um, wanted to repeal it. And in Colorado, there is a citizens initiative um, procedure that's available where if they get a certain number of signatures on a petition, which I think is 100,000, um, they can get a law repealed at the next election. So November 3rd, Colorado had a vote yes on proposition, I think it's 113, whatever, on a proposition. And that's what the video in the beginning with the guy singing was singing about. And it did pass. It was a big fight. There was a lot of campaigning um, to vote yes and also to vote no. And it did pass. So it does remain law in Colorado. That's part of the 15 states here that have already passed it. And it will remain so. So let's test your knowledge of the national popular vote. Okay, true or false? Currently, the candidate who gets the most popular, I'm sorry, the candidate who gets the most votes in the nation, the national popular vote, wins the US presidency. Well, that's false. That's what we're talking about. Currently, it's who gets the most electoral votes, and that accords with who gets um, the popular vote state by state. In the 2016 election, Wisconsin voters voted 1,404,284 for Donald Trump and 1,382,000 for Hillary Clinton. So that part I'll tell you is true. So Wisconsin's 10 electoral votes were divided equally, or I'm sorry, they were divided proportionally, six for Donald Trump and four for Hillary Clinton. So that's false. Of course, Wisconsin, like 47 other states, has what's called the winner take all allocation of electoral votes. And that means that whoever wins the presidential in the race, presidential race in the state currently gets all 10 of our electoral votes. Currently, the presidential candidate who gets the most votes in Wisconsin is awarded all 10 of Wisconsin's electoral votes. Well, that's true. That's just what I went over. Wyoming has one elector for 189,500 people. Well, California has one for every 697,000 people. Now, we haven't talked about this. That is true. Because of the number of electors that are constant, so every state gets their two electors for US um, senators, and then one for each congressional district, so there's a minimum of three. And then as states grow larger and larger, they have more people but the number of electors or number of congressional representatives they have, therefore the number of electors, is frozen by the Reapportionment Act of 1929. And that disadvantages the states that, as they grow, as they're adding more people per elector. So what ends up is Wyoming is 189,000 per elector, while California has one for every 697,000 people. Currently, whoever gets 270 or more electoral votes from the states wins the United States presidency. Well, that's true. The way states direct their electors to vote for the president is mandated by the Constitution. That's false, again, because the, the Constitution in Article 2 leaves it up to the states to determine that. The candidate who wins the nationwide electoral vote is always the same as the winner of the national popular vote. No, false, as, now, as it is now, that is not true because five of our 45 presidents have lost the popular vote, but they won the electoral vote and they became president. The national popular vote interstate compact is an agreement among the states to award all of their electoral votes to the presidential candidate who wins the most votes in the country. And that is true. And lastly, the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact becomes effective when states having a cumulative 270 electoral votes pass the state national popular vote legislation. And that is true. Again, 16 jurisdictions have passed it. Only states with only 74 more electoral votes are needed. Now in Wisconsin last year, bills were introduced in our state legislature. Um, they never were given a hearing. They will have to be reintroduced in the upcoming legislation 
legislative session. And then we're going to have to push for it if we want them to have a hearing with um, a recalcitrant legislature, probably. What's the league's position on this? Well, the US League has supported, first of all, direct vote for the president versus through electoral vote, um, long time. And in 2010, at its convention, the US League specifically endorsed the national popular vote interstate compact as one acceptable way to achieve this goal. Starting in 2018, League of Women Voters US made national popular vote one of its five priorities in our Making Democracy Work campaign. And that this year, it, that was continued at the National Convention. There is a US task force that has studied this and decided um, what the US League's position is. And they are encouraging right now state by state people, um, leagues to go ahead if they're interested and support the national popular vote. They are working on a web page on the US um, website that will have resources available. Um, statewide, our general broad position that uh, promotes an open government, um, uh, sorry, an open government system that is representative, accountable, responsive, and capable of making decisions covers the national popular vote. So what can you do? Well, we can start calling legislatures, writing um, letters to the editor, letting people know that we want to join the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, telling people and educating people on it. As I said, it is a very confusing, not the pop National Popular Vote, but how we currently elect people, presidents with the Electoral College. That's, I think, very confusing. And most of us do not understand it at this point. Social media and do presentations like this. There are resources available to you. Um, ultimately, I said the US League will have a resource page. We in our state league have a resource page that has background material, a, sl a slide presentation with script, which we probably will be updating a little bit in the next couple of months, a quiz, like the quiz similar to the quiz I included in this presentation that's kind of fun to start meetings with. It has a one page handout with a summary. Now, I don't know, I'm hoping you can see this. This book, if you're really interested, is called Let the People Pick the President. It's by Jesse Wegman, who is a New York Times columnist. This is a great book. It's very understandable. Tells some of the history with the Electoral College, talks about the various issues we've talked about today. And if you're interested in the, um, to get more depth in a pretty easy reading book, I would recommend this. So the National Popular Vote Bill guarantees that the president guarantees the presidency to the candidate who receives the most popular votes nationally. So thanks. That's the end of my presentation. I will take um, the questions and let's see if I can figure out how to move to a slide here to something else. So let me just try that. This hopefully. Okay, sorry about this. I think it's this one. Okay, can you see that slide? Yes, I can. Okay, good. Okay, well, we're talking about big states, and that's, of course, big population states, not big territorial states. And this shows an example when how many states it would take to get over 270 electoral votes. Um, if you just looked at um, big states. Sorry, so, Barb, I'm sorry, that whole slide isn't available. Can you enlarge it? Go to full screen, I think we'll do it. Um, just a minute, I'm trying to figure out why. Go to full screen. I think the little green dot, well, I guess it depends on what computer you're using. Oh, here we go, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just was blanking, huh, there we go, thank you. Um, so this is presumes a landslide election for one candidate where one candidate would get 60% and the other 40%. That's a huge landslide election, okay? And would probably never happen, but this is for illustrative purposes, okay? Let's assume it's a landslide. 
And you start with the largest state here, which was California, and you keep adding states. Can you see my cursor going down? Otherwise I can switch it to a, each, down the row. And you keep adding states and adding states to get over 50% of the electoral vote. It would take you all the way, 26 states, and even to states such as Louisiana and Oregon, which aren't probably considered that big of states. It would take that many states to reach the 51% vote. Okay, so that the large states can't really control the popular vote. This is a, on a landslide basis. So think about if it was a normal closer election, which most of our elections seem to go. So I think that shows a lot of the big state um, myth kind of that the big states would control a popular vote. Um, similarly, people will argue the big cities do, you know, New York, San Francisco, Chicago. Um, and there's a similar uh, the, uh, analysis where it, like if you look at the number of big cities, I think it takes a hundred, the top hundred cities um, in the US um, still do not come up to anywhere near the 50%. And that goes down to like Spokane, Washington is one of the, like the, around the hundredth area. Um, there is, approximately equal number of people in the cities, the urban areas, and the rural areas throughout the whole country. Um, and then what that excludes, of course, are the suburban areas. And so some of the argument here would be to convince people in the suburban areas. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Ellen. Time-wise, um, that's another an issue. I mean, with the, obviously they're saying, would people go to every state? you know, and every, you know, what they had to cover the whole country. Well, obviously, um, right now, what, what I'm really, in, uh, right now, if you, let's say, take a state like Wisconsin, when the candidates come, when we saw um, Donald Trump come to Wisconsin, he didn't just go to um, the big cities. Of course, he was coming here to Green Bay and to La Crosse and to Janesville. Um, and so, and encapsulating some of the rural areas, of course, around those smaller cities. So, the analysis is that candidates would probably do similar around the whole country because it's not just the, the battleground states votes that would count. Every single person's vote would count. Every single person, rural and city, small state and big state. So everybody's voice, vote really becomes important and nobody's vote is thrown away. It's all part, it's all part of the final tally. Now, are there other questions? Yes, there are some, uh, Barb. The first one is, why does this encourage candidates toward the middle ground? Probably related to what you were just talking about, but maybe you could elaborate on that. Yeah, I think mostly it's because you have to attract the most number of people. And, you know, when we think about um, far ends, primaries, for instance, where you always had the far left and the far right, and that's where some of our candidates get elected because that's the extremes of both parties tend to be the people who vote in the primaries. And in this national election where every single person vote counts, we'd have every single person, hopefully as many, like this year, we had huge outcome, huge participation this year. Everybody's vote would count. And so to kind of reach out to everybody, I don't, candidates would probably be disadvantaged to take far right or the far left, need to come to the middle to get the most people. Hey Barb, this is Robin. I'm getting a few notes that um, some folks were not able to see that last slide that you put up. I wonder if you could try that again. Wait, which one? Right now, according to mine, I'm still sharing and I have the big state example with the 60, 40 percent. Is that the one yeah. you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. That's not showing up. On, I've got a number of different chats here of folks saying they're not seeing right. it. Yeah. Okay. Can you see it? I No, I can't, but, but I think somebody else said they could so I thought it might have been just mine. I have no idea why that is happening. I would do what I did last time is I'll um just a minute. Looking for my share screen icon that disappeared on me. Hmm. There it is. I just missed it. Okay I'm gonna go off and come back on again. I don't know what else to do. All right, we'll try that. How's that? Yes. 
Oh, I just took it off. Sorry. Nope. How's that? We see a circle with a 49% and a 51%. That's it. it. That's it. That's it. So what we shows this here is by largest state, starting with California, then Texas, then Florida, and then going down the column and then the next column. So it would take 26 states to hit over 51% of the vote. And that's assuming that would be for the 60% popular vote winner, which you know is not going to happen. Um, you know, we never get a 60-40 um, popular vote national uh, outcome. Do you want the next question, Barb? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, next question is, can state legislatures tinker with the way um, the Wisconsin electoral vote would be handled in the next few months? Okay, this is what I know about this. And I, I'm not an expert on this. And I, um, this is the, what I have understood. What if, let's say, our state legislature, despite the fact that Vice President Biden won by 20,000 votes, and let's assume that's certified in the next couple of weeks, and they say, well, we don't care. We think it's a fraudulent election and we're not going to, we're not going to go along with the certification of that slate of electors, the democratic slate that would be sent to the 10 electors for the Democrats, for Biden. We're not gonna go along with it. We think it was a fraudulent election. So they send their own slate. Let's say they sent a Republican slate for, for um, Trump. So what happens if we end up with two, one certified by the state and signed by the governor and one separate one sent by the Republican legislature? Um, there is, as I understand it, a law, and I don't have it right in front of me, it's a federal law that talks about that situation. And it's supposed to only happen if there's substantial evidence of the fraud. Again, and, um, and there is a procedure, as I understand it, that the Congress is supposed to start acting as a trier of fact in good faith to determine which is factually the true expression, the true slate of electors that represent the state's vote. And there's a lot of nervousness because Congress, um, the Senate, during the impeachment procedure was supposed to act similarly. And in fact, many senators, and I think McConnell came out and said he wasn't going to do that, you know, and it was like predetermined that they were not going to give it a fair judicial um, analysis. So that's that. They're supposed to, there is a procedure by it. There's an article by, oh, I wish I had this in front of me, Lessig, who is a Harvard professor out there. It's in the Atlantic, end of October, if anybody's looking for it. Um, and it, it talks about it in detail, what is supposed to happen. Um, I'm just hoping we don't get there. And I don't, you know, the red, to analyze this more is beyond me, but that's basically where it is if you have two or more slates of electors being presented to Congress. Um, sorry, that's all I know. <laughs> I have another question for you. Um, what would it look like if all states had systems like Maine and Nebraska? Okay, now I got I another slide for you, a proportional vote. And okay, I'm so scared to keep doing this because I keep turning you guys off. So maybe it might take a little bit here. Um, let's see here. Well, it's not letting me resume sharing. What are you still seeing the old slide? Uh-huh. Boy, I have to learn how to do this better because I'm gonna pause the share. Nothing, huh? Okay, we'll do it this way. Okay, there we go. So are you seeing it first of all? Yes. Oh, good. Okay, so the um, biggest problem with proportional voting by districts, to, and to me, you know, normally that sounds intuitively, okay, 
rational. Uh, and this is the problem. And the problem is that we very seldom have just two candidates who are running in each state. We usually have third party, maybe fourth party, maybe fifth party candidates running. And what that would do in a proportional vote could do is make it more, <coughs> excuse me, make it more likely that the uh, that no candidate would get 270 electoral votes. And this slide, uh, well, let me make this um, large for you too, um, shows that. So this is from 2016 and it has Arizona and um, Colorado. And Arizona has 11 electoral votes, Colorado has nine. So this is the percent for Clinton and the percent for Trump. And then the percent for others. So you see that Arizona had 5% for third, let's just call it third party candidates, and uh, Colorado had nine. And so when you take that to the electoral votes, so Arizona would have five electoral votes for Clinton's representing Clinton's 45%, 5.5 electoral votes for Trump's 50%, and 0.5 for all other third party candidates. And doing the same for Colorado the electoral vote would be divided 4.2 for Clinton, 4.0 for Trump, and 0.8 for all the other third party candidates. And so um, they would end up with 200, when you took the, take this and extrapolate to the co entire country, do it for all the states, you would end up doing 257 electoral votes for Clinton, 253 for um, Trump, and you see neither have 270 votes and because 27 other votes went, would have gone to third party candidates. What happens when neither candidate reaches 270? The election's thrown to the House of Representatives to vote. And in the House of Representatives, it's not total representatives who get to vote. It's one vote per state, one vote per congressional districts in each state. So somehow Wisconsin, and I tell you the truth, I don't know, but I'm guessing we have more Republican than Democratic congressional representatives and who would get to cast our vote. And that's, nobody really wants it. I don't think either party want our presidential elections thrown to the House of Representatives. That leads, I think, to the next question quite nicely. How would um, national popular vote interact with ranked choice voting? Would that make a difference? Um, I, you know what, I, I think the answer is no, I can't give you the rationale right now because I haven't studied that myself that much. Um, one of the resources I listed was nationalpopularvote.com. I'll, I'll, I'm not going to try to go back to the, the slide, but it's all small letters, nationalpopularvote.com. That's the national uh, grassroots organization that goes back to 2007 that has been fighting for the national popular vote uh, since then. They have bought more information than you ever want. And it has all the different scenarios. And if you're, I'm pretty sure if you look at that, you could find the ranked choice voting and how that would affect the national popular vote. I would just throw in here at this point that um our website will have a link to that when we download the recorded program. So um, folks can find it there as well. Great. And we have one more question. It is um, why even keep the electoral college if this compact passes? Because it's constitutional. And the only way to get rid of it is with a constitutional amendment. So what the national popular vote does is allow us to reach the same re result, a national popular vote, within the electoral college it doesn't abolish it doesn't side you know go around it it legally constitutionally elects the president through the electoral college it just happens to coincide with who the national popular vote winner is rather than the state by state state popular vote winners one more question, um, and I'm not sure I'm phrasing this correctly. This one is mine. How was the determination made that this would happen if you got 270, um, the equivalent of 270 votes from state legislatures? Do you have to worry about states that don't agree to that challenging it in court? Ultimately, I mean, are there, if we have enough states who join, mm -hmm. that we have 270 electoral votes, Mm -hmm. And then the states who didn't join say, hey, hey, that's not fair, that's not fair. 
yeah, they're probably, we're expecting that there will probably be some court challenges, of course, okay. coming up, but you know, this group and our group thinks that there are good legal arguments against it. Well, thank you. That's all the questions we have. Great. Well, thank you for having me, everybody. I hope that you all go out and, you know, spread the word and want to do some presentations like this and teach people about it and especially start contacting the legislature. I think they're going to, going to need to be hearing over and over and over from us, you know, that this is something that we as a nation want. One thing I wanted to point out, you know, a lot of times because um, right now, because Trump won in 2016, this has become partisan, which we don't think it is partisan. We think it's very nonpartisan and it's changed from time to time. In fact, Donald Trump himself prior said he was in favor of it because he would win, would have won the popular vote um, if he had campaigned that way. And maybe he would have. Um, but um, shoot, I lost my train of conference. Um, Ah, oh, so um, and one of the things uh, that conservatives or Republicans need to think about, because there's a bunch of Republicans who also support the national popular vote, and that's that the, de the demographics in states is always changing. And let's take Texas, which has been reliably, reliably, reliably Republican. And this year, many people thought it was going to go Democratic. It did not. But the demographics are changing. And it's expected that someday that will become Democratic. So what happens then? I think, I think Texas has 38 electoral votes. All of a sudden, those 38 electoral votes go to the Democrats. And it's going to switch. That'd be you know, in the Democrats' favor. And the Republicans will be not wanting a electoral vote state by state election. So demographics change and, and they will be changing. And so this is for everybody's benefit because it's one person, one vote and every vote would count. And that's, and that's a good argument, I believe. Barb, well, thank you. No, before we sign off, Barb, this is Helen speaking. Um, can you give us you know, a short list of the arguments against national popular vote? Because I know they are, out there and I know one of them you know as I'm sitting here I'm thinking um, you know congressional districts and the number of um, electoral votes can change over time for a state right given right. what happens with redistricting in the census well the number won't change because well but the allocation changes right the allocation I guess a state could lose electoral votes you know if we all of a sudden gain and you can't, the large states can't gain anymore because like California, they're limited because that, what would happen if the 435 representatives in the House of Representatives kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, it'd be unyieldy and we couldn't have an effective house. So that's limited by law. So the large states are limited that way. And I guess we each state could lose if they got smaller. And, and sorry, what was the question? Well, I'm just, I'm just wondering how, um, you know, redistricting and redoing congressional districts based on census um, affects the electoral college, and it wouldn't. It doesn't affect national popular vote because it's still just based on the vote. Exactly, it does not affect the national popular vote at all. Yeah, my other concern is that because there are constitutional provisions that the argument is going to be whether and whoever whether it's republicans or democrats or whatever supporting it at the time um, isn't it going to be whether or not the state legislatures can change it up so much that essentially it takes it out of the constitutional provisions that that kind of becomes a, a legal argument i'm just thinking I'm about sure what you mean by change it up so much um yeah, because the constitution provides how it's done, um, the states, but the states have some latitude. Well, the constitution provides that it's the states appointing their electors and how it's done in terms of, it's up to the states, for instance, Nebraska and Maine do it proportionately and the rest of us do it by a state popular vote. Um, and that's, that's what's left up to the states. 
the number of electors in each state is prescribed by the constitution. Okay. Barb, I do have a few more questions that came in. Sorry, I was skipping back and forth between, we're getting them from two locations instead of one. So I wanna add a few more. What's the significant percentage of votes that would show substantial voter fraud? <laughs> I think that's a question of fact, uh, you know? And then that, I, I don't know the answer to that, but to me, I'd argue that's a question of fact, you know? Okay, um, next one is, could you repeat the name of the Harvard professor who wrote the article in the Atlantic, name and spelling? Yeah, his name I think is Lessig. I, I, I think that's right. I read that article, I think it's L-E-S-S-I-G. Does that sound yeah. right? Yeah, I'm looking for it on my desk. I have no idea where I put it. Um, I think that's right. Um, and it was well, in the Atlantic and I think October 25th. We'll and add it to the. I'll, we'll get that and add it to our um, link to the recording on our website, so yeah. people can check for it's it there. Pretty, I mean, let's just say it's a little bit deep, you know, and it's confusing. Um, and that it only applies if there's more than one slate of electors from a particular state that's sent to Congress. This one is more of a comment, but maybe you'd like to, to bounce off of this comment. It seems from the list of states that if the percentages are 51. To 49 that a much smaller number of states could make up the 51. Smaller states with fewer electoral votes would not be pleased. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. I'm talking about, is this, if there's a national popular vote and it's 51%? I'm thinking that's what it means, yeah. So would, would smaller states not be pleased? Okay, so somebody, I, I think this is going to, does the electoral college benefit small states? Basically, is that what really? Yes, I, and I think it's saying if it was very close, like 51 to 49, that a smaller number of states could make it. So what you showed us was a landslide. I, I think this person is saying if the vote were closer, those bigger states would have more impact. I think that's how I'm interpreting it. So 50, a smaller number of states could make up the 51%. I think if it was a closer election, the, the larger states would have less impact. I think. Because, you know, um, one thing about the smaller states, and there's always an argument that the electoral college is meant to benefit the smaller states. First of all, we got to go back, and I'm not going to do that now, but into the history of the electoral college and how it came about. There's a, mm -hmm. a, a big, uh, a lot of people think the electoral college, as it finally came out after a long time of debating and Tiring at the, at the Constitutional Convention, where they were tired and ready to go. It was a concession to the South, the slave holding states of the South, who wanted a bigger say. And because the Black people in their states didn't count, they were, okay, they were, they wanted them, they counted three fifths of a person, but they couldn't vote. They wanted to use that three, three fifths of a person in the election of the president. So that's some of the history of the Electoral College. Another argument people make is it's supposed to help small states, but does it really help small states? First of all, I have an, in 2016, the top, um, I think it was at all states that had six electoral votes or less, it was equal. I have a slide, but I'm not gonna try to get it. Equal, Clinton and um, Trump. <laughs> Clinton and Trump were equal in those small states, exactly. So small states don't always vote as a block, and have, they have diverse interests, just like big states do. There are rural areas, there are urban areas, there are industrial people, there are farmers, um, and people have different policy preferences. So um, that part isn't necessarily true. And on top of it, they talk about candidate, candidate attention to those states, they aren't getting that. They are getting zero attention. Um, it, most, in the last three elections, there's only been a few uh, campaign events in the small states. So they aren't even listened to because they're not part of the battleground states. One last question, Barb. Um, why are the identities of the electors seldom if ever disclosed publicly? Who selects the electors? So it's my understanding that each, I don't know if it differs from each state, but um, the 
political parties pick the slate of electors. I think it's more ceremonial at this point um, that they pick, you know, there are 10 Democrats or 10 Republicans, and those are the people who are the electors, and um, they vote as a block. Now, somebody made reference in one of the questions a little bit last year, I think it was, there was what they were calling the faithless elector cases that went up to the Supreme Court. That was the result of the 2016 election, where in an attempt to stop Trump taking office, some electors were um, threatening or did try to vote. Um, they were part of their slate of electors from their state and they were trying to vote in a different manner um, than as a black. And it went up to the Supreme Court and I think the Supreme Court held that if a state has certain um, provisions where they are supposed to vote as a black, they could not change their mind and vote differently. That's the other, this is just aside from the electoral college and its creation in the time of the constitution. One of the other um, thoughts is that um, it, because it was a country that was just starting out and there, weren't, there was not a lot of sophistication, um, plus you had the problem of distance and communication between the states um, in voting that at one time there was a the thought that maybe even the electoral college each state would really re uh, either elect or appoint electors who use their own judgment and who they're going to vote for not the popular vote of the state. Um, and I think obviously that's not happening today, but that's some of the history. Any more questions? Sorry, I was muted. No, Barb, that's the last of the questions I've been uh, had submitted so far. Right. Um, I think, Ellen, it was you, I think, asked about some of the arguments against this, which, um, and some of them are the large state would control, the large cities would control. Um, what else did we cover here? There, there are what we, I mean, that's referred to as, quote, myths a lot by the National Popular Vote Organization, which is, um, but there are myth after myth after myth or counter argument versus counter argument on that national popular vote website. And you can go into that in detail with that. Um, as again, I keep saying they have more information than everyone want to know, but it does address the things that are thrown out in various oppositions. Well, Barb, thank you so much for this great information. We really appreciate having you here. Um, I, I want to thank the audience for joining us um, and uh, your questions and the discussion was just so timely and, and I learned a lot. Um, I also want to say that um, uh, uh, we hope that you join us for our next Lunch and Learn in December. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, fair maps in Wisconsin and hopefully maybe some of you can join us on our happy hour and we hope that you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you know, let me, can I just say one thing real quick? If anybody, we do have a state working group for the state league. And if anybody wants to join that, um, we were dormant just now for the last five months because of the election coming up and a lot of fair maps work going on. We'll probably be starting that up again. It's good to have people from around the state join it. If anybody's interested, you can email me um, or I may give you my email, which is bpatrick at gmail.com. So it's B-P-A-T-E. R I C K at gmail.com, and I'll be happy to add you to the group. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.